Hello. Oh my goodness, you all made it. It was getting hairy there for a minute with weather, I know. Um, but you all made your flights and your drives, and thank you. Um, we are so, so honored to be here to open South by Southwest EDU, and we just wanna thank Ron and the whole team for having us. Um, we are um, going to show you stories today, uh, four stories from teachers on the theme of schooling and getting schooled. That is the theme of today. And, and one of the reasons why we wanna do this is that we're, we wanna open the conference with teacher voices, right? We wanna open the conference with real experiences of teachers. Um, so I'd like to, uh, just a round of applause if you've never heard of The Moth before you came to South by Southwest EDU. Oh, good. Excellent, oh, welcome. And a round of applause if you have heard of The Moth. Okay, okay. Some friends, some friends in the audience and some new friends as well. So if you, if you haven't heard of The Moth, I'll give you the, the briefest of rundowns. We are a nonprofit organization. We're dedicated to true stories told live. People come on stage behind a microphone just like this and tell a story from their life with no notes. I get notes because I'm hosting um, and also this is a really big room. Um, <laughs> But, um, but we, we tell true stories as remembered by the teller. Uh, we don't get fact-checked um, unless our parents are in the audience in the front row, <laughs> um, in which case we might. And, um, and it's really something uh, pretty extraordinary that, that can happen. And we have shows all over the country and the world. We have a radio hour, we have the podcast that Ron mentioned, um, but we also have, and, and my personal favorite part, we have the Moth Education Program. So we work with high school students and we share curriculum with K-12 teachers, we work with teachers, and all those things are sharing uh, stories, making space for sharing the stories of our lives and what that can do. And so that's what brings us here today, is um, we are gonna start the, we're gonna start the conference with stories from people's lives. Um, and it specifically from teachers' lives. Uh, stories of experience of teachers and real teachers and real students. So let's hear it for them first. <laughs> so this week is going to be full of new ideas, new strategies, new tech, fish tacos, right? <laughs> oh, so many. Um, and, and before we, we launch into that, we wanted to make sure that we had a chance to hear real voices and reflect on our own stories. And so before we, we get started, um, what do we mean by a moth story exactly, right? Storytelling can mean so many different things. Well, for the moth, um, a story is something that's um, true, as I said before. It's something that's on time. We like to say that anyone can tell a 45-minute story. You all know those people. Um, you might, uh, you might, you know, fondly think of yourself as one of those people, also totally fine. Um, but it takes some skill to tell a five to ten minute story, to really get it done in a little bit of time. So all the stories you're going to hear today are between five and ten minutes, probably around eight. Um, so a story has to be on time. A story has to have some kind of a change. Uh, we like to say that the difference between an anecdote and a story is that the, the story is something that changed you in some way, even really small, right? It doesn't have to be the biggest change of your life, but something that mattered to you and made you who you are. And that's the key a lot of times to what makes a story a thing that connects us, right? That connects us to, um, to the people listening. And finally, for a moth story, it has to be on theme. All of our shows have themes. This show is no different. Um, the theme, as we said, is schooling and getting schooled. Um, and so all the stories you're going to hear are going to have something to do with that theme. They're not going to necessarily use those words, but that's what they're going to be about. Um, I was thinking about the theme a lot, of course, on the way over, and um, ways that I ended up learning uh, and, and how I ended up picking things up on the job. I was a third grade teacher for several years. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, I, uh, I did not have any classroom management uh, chops when I started, especially. I really did not. And all of my co-teachers really did. They had it locked down. And there was one very early in my, my teaching, we had to bring 73rd graders on the two train, the subway train, uh, at 9 a.m. on rush hour. That is why I'm excited to be in a room full of teachers. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Can you imagine? And so I knew not only how are we gonna keep them from sort of like walking off the edge of the platform, but also 
everyone there is going to just be going to work and they're going to be so annoyed when they see all of these eight-year-olds like flood into the car, right? And I have my 23rd graders that I'm in charge of and all of my co-teachers are so in charge. They've got like really nice lines and no one's talking and the, the, the other groups of kids and my kids are like maniacs and I'm thinking I've got to do something and so I think really fast and I say, you guys, let's, let's do something. Let's play a prank on the people who come to, uh, who, who are in our subway car. Do you guys know what rush hour is? And they do, and I say, okay, so when you go on rush hour, you're going to your office, you've got your coffee, you're super bored, you're just thinking about the meetings you've got, and you don't, you don't want to think about anything, and it's really quiet, and they're going to see us, they're going to be very annoyed. So what if we pretend that we're 40? <laughs> what if we just get on, and we're really bored, and we're heading to the office, it's gonna really freak them out. And my kids are pretty into it. <laughs> they, like, they like pranks. So the subway doors open and you see everyone just go, oh no, eight-year-olds, right? And my kids come in and they just... <sighs> and they sit down and it's totally quiet and everyone's looking around like, what's happening? And just then this one kid, Teddy, who always got way too into things, is leaning up against a pole and just totally silent car, le sides very heavily and goes, <sighs> meetings. <laughs> and he taught me classroom management that day, you guys. <laughs> um, so that's what I think about when I think about getting schooled. But you are going to hear four stories. I will say I will be one of the storytellers as well. You're going to hear four stories about getting schooled and schooling. And so um, are you guys ready for your first storyteller? <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, so let me read this. So when we bring storytellers to the mic, we like to ask them a question, and we bring them to the mic by giving you the answer to that question. So the question I asked backstage was, tell us about a time you learned your lesson. And when I asked this first storyteller to tell us about a time you learned your lesson, he said, I have to read it because it's very good. Getting a haircut at the $10 underground Astor Place Barber right before a destination wedding. Please welcome Tim Manley. So in January of 2008, I started teaching 11th and 12th grade English at a public school in Manhattan. So I was 22 at the time, but I looked like I was like 15. And the kids were 17, but they looked like they were like 35. So. They didn't think I could possibly be their English teacher, but they liked that my name was Mr. Manley. <laughs> On the first day of the semester, I got to my classroom like an hour early so I could carefully arrange my handouts at the front of the room, pretend I'm not about to have a panic attack. I was wearing my favorite green tie, which I had pre-knotted the night before. <laughs> Nora Jones played softly in the background. <laughs> then, the kids came in and everything just exploded. And there's 15 kids sitting over here at this table on the other side of the room completely alone is one guy in a dragon t-shirt. Nobody brought a pen. There were two girls making out in the doorway. I was like, listen, I, I support you guys, but like, <laughs> not right here. And then the principal came in and he was like, I'm just gonna sit in and observe this lesson. And I was like, that sounds like something that would happen in my life at this moment. <laughs> and I, I walk up to the front of the classroom and my, my heart is racing and I tell myself, I'm like, don't panic, Mr. Manley. This is a safe space. But then I see my principal standing in the back of the room and he's just frowning. And he's a big guy with full length sleeve tattoos. He used to be a drummer in a punk band. He has been frowning for a long time. He's good at it. And I see him and I, 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 I just start to stutter and I, I fidget with my tie. And then I look around my room and I see that all my students are just looking at each other like, oh. He's new. <laughs> and this basically repeats itself for the first few months of teaching. I plan my heart out. I show up and I'm excited, but I'm terrified. And regardless of whether the principal comes in, although he does come in a lot, I just crumple right in front of my class. 
until one Friday, I get home from school, I collapse onto my bed, I open up my laptop, and I have an email from a friend of mine from grad school. And she says that she has an interview coming up at my school for an 11th and 12th grade English teacher position. <laughs> you guys are way ahead of where I was at that moment. I started writing back to her, I was like, that is so great, the kids are so cool. And then I was like, oh no. <laughs> I'm the 11th and 12th grade English teacher. And I don't tell her that it's probably my job she's applying for because I'm just like so embarrassed and instead I help her prepare for the interview. I was raised Catholic, you guys, and that feels very relevant right now. And on Monday, I get to my classroom, I'm arranging the handouts at the front of the room and the principal pokes his head in and he just confirms they're, they're testing the water. They're just thinking about someone else for my job. And that day at lunch, I just, I avoid my colleagues. I don't go out with them. I'm so ashamed. It's like I know that they know. And I just hide in the corner of my room where you can't see me from the doorway. And I just eat Luna bars, which I know the package says they're for women, but I'm anemic, so I need the iron. <laughs> and at the end of lunch, my kids start coming back in. And I'm just looking at each one. And I'm like, oh, I love that kid so much. Oh my God, that guy is so cool. Look. There are the two girls making out in the doorway again. Why can't I be as confident as they clearly are? But then I remind myself, like, I used to be that confident when I was their age. When I was 17, I did stand-up comedy all the time. I, I grew up on Long Island, and I would go to the comedy club behind the McDonald's across the street from the airport. Very classy place. <laughs> Every day before a show, I was so nervous I couldn't eat, but I would still get up there and do it. And all I wanted as a teacher was to get back that part of me that could act like I was fearless, even when I was terrified. And I'm thinking about that as the kids are coming back from, from lunch, and one kid says to me, oh, you know, Mr. Manley, in a few weeks, we're gonna have the annual teacher talent show. And without thinking, I go, I'll do stand-up comedy in it. And he goes, okay, I'm not organizing it. <laughs> I was just telling you. And now for the next few weeks, it's like there's this fire inside of me and my teaching and the principal has stopped coming in to observe me because he's seen enough. And that's great because now I feel more comfortable. And we do a transcendentalism unit and I stand on top of tables and shout Thoreau quotes and I hide Walt Whitman poems all over the school. And during my prep periods, I start jotting down all these ideas for my set at the teacher talent show. And that night comes, and, and now I'm, I'm backstage at the teacher talent show, and I'm pacing back and forth in the dark while all of the other acts go on. There's, um, there's the guidance counselor singing Jason Mraz's I'm Yours. Uh, there's the whole, all the eighth grade teachers dancing to a Beyonce medley. And there's also the annual sketch about the copy machine breaking down. Very dramatic. Very dramatic. And... I'm thinking to myself, like, I, I can do this. This is going to be great. And then I get a text from my friend from grad school uh, saying that she's been offered the job. <laughs> and there's this voice in my head that's just like, this is the proof that I've been waiting for. All of my fears about myself are true. I'm a failure. But then I, I say to myself, what would 17-year-old Tim do besides stay at home on a Friday night and play Pokemon. And I walk on stage and the lights are so bright and the room is full of teens on a Friday night. It's terrifying. My voice feels like sandpaper, but I, I start talking and I tell them stories about when I was their age, how I was the kid at my school who had not one, but two t-shirts of the genie from Aladdin. I was the kid in the dragon t-shirt. And I also tell them about how I was well known at my school for my very realistic kitten meow. And they start to laugh and it feels amazing. It's like I'm being me and they like me. And I guess I start to actually feel good because then I start improvising a little bit and I say, yeah, I actually got this job because I beat the principal in a street fight. He was stronger than me, but I had cat-like reflexes. And then I don't know why, I lean into the microphone and I went, are you here right now? <laughs> and, and the room is silent. It's the first time I've gotten kids silent all year. <laughs> and from the back just comes, standing right here. 
And I went, good, because I'm not done with you yet. And I walked off the stage, and the whole auditorium started chanting, manly, manly, manly. And after the show, all the 10th graders ran up to the principal, and they said they were so excited to take my class next year. And like, it's not like I got my confidence back. I've never been confident. I'm still terrified of most things most of the time. But that Monday, when I got to my classroom to arrange the handouts, the principal pokes his head into my room, and he's smiling. We're like old war buddies now. And he shakes my hand, and he says, I have my job back for the fall. And I taught at that school for four more years. I, I, oh. <laughs> well, let me tell you guys, I found out later that actually my friend from grad school turned down the position. So, <laughs> I think they were just kind of stuck with me, but I like to think I kept that job because I killed it up there. Thank you. Tim Manley, everyone. Um, so now you get the idea. That's, that's what happens in a mob story. Um, so Tim did end up working at uh, school, the, 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 his school for five years. He also um, taught, um, after he had left being a teacher, he, um, he stayed at that school as the instructor for the moth, teaching storytelling after school with them for another five years. And um, I actually got a chance to teach with Tim the first time we did um, a, a high school after school program for the moth at this school. And when we had our first show, it was an auditorium, it was full of kids, and the host you know, called out, you know, thanks to Mr. Manley for bringing us to this school and the whole place started going manly manly <laughs> and it was the first time I was like oh that's what a rock star is like <laughs> it was amazing I've never seen anything like it so it was really beautiful one more hand for Tim it was really great um, I feel like there should be a way to collect information from you as an audience if any of you are principals out there right now and are considering full sleeve tattoos. I would like to collect that information from you. I don't know if you're thinking about it. Um, so we're gonna bring our next storyteller to the stage. Um, are you ready for your next story? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, when I asked our next storyteller, tell us about a time you learned your lesson. She said, when I started a hike at sunset, the sun goes down very rapidly. Please welcome to the stage, Crystal Dukert. When I first started teaching, I was 21, which means I looked 12. So I learned really early on that I needed to put up a wall, you know, kind of have that line between my personal life and my teaching persona. And I was pretty good at this for about 10 years until my husband decided to drunkenly divulge a lie best kept secret. He confessed that he had lied about who he had voted for in the 2008 election. That would be the first Obama election, McCain Palin. And when he said it to me, I was sober and so I didn't take it very well and <laughs> Normally, I would like to just say for the record that I believe that people are entitled to their political beliefs, unless, of course, you're married to me and the presidential nominee is Barack Obama. Because, come on, people, looking like me in the 80s was not trendy. There was no Bruno Mars waiting in the hallway, singing and dancing. It was just me, the daughter of a black man from the D.C. ghetto, and a white woman from a small town in England who met on vacation in Greece and decided to get married six months later on a whim and moved to conservative Texas. So, <laughs> it was amazing, it was. So, a vote against Barack was essentially a vote against me. Around this same time though, my students were supposed to be doing a rhetorical speech. And I was like, all right, people, we're gonna be writing a speech about an issue of personal importance. And in my class, there are three rules. One, you have to pick a topic that you're willing to talk about with others, revising and editing together. Second, you gotta read that speech out loud. Third, when you're in the audience, you have to be the human that we all hope to one day become. And so, to prove that I'm equally invested in this process, I did my own speech as well. 
Now, if you'll recall, I'm still spiraling because of this confession. <laughs> so I let little bits of myself slip into my speech. I was supposed to be talking about um, the effect of the shootings of unarmed black men in the black community. And I then just started to add little bits about myself. I said, you know what? It's really hard to be a brown person in white spaces when you feel like you have to constantly defend yourself and prove why black lives matter, apparently even in your own household. <laughs> then I told them about when I was a little girl, people would call me a mutt or a mulatto or an Oreo. And when I would tell my dad, he would say, well, this is their world. We just live in it. You'll be fine. It's like, oh, okay, Dad, I got that. And then I somehow said, actually, I've gone through my whole life feeling invisible, and it's killing me from the inside out. So at this point, as you can imagine, all of my juniors are staring at me like, wow. <laughs> And I've actually managed to stun myself because what crazy teacher does this? So in order to get back on track, I was like, all right, people, we need to talk about the real world because there is real world writing. It is a thing. And so I pulled up an email from the White House listserv because I obviously stalk Obama through email. And this particular email was announcing a summit that was going to be taking place in D.C. that summer. And I said, look, I'm going to take this speech that I just read, copy, paste, submit, click. Look, people, real world writing. It's a thing. And then I forgot about it because obviously I was just trying to prove a point. But a couple weeks later, much to my surprise, I received an email that I had been accepted to attend this summit in D.C. And so you would think I would be more excited to tell my students, but that's not the case. I needed to get home to gloat to my husband. And so when he walked in the door, I said, guess what, honey? I am going on a journey to live my best brown life. Yes. And he said, awesome, honey, I can't wait to go with you. And I said, ah, 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 ah. It's my best brown life, and well, you're white, honey, and you can't come on my best brown life journey, but when you get back, we can talk about it. And he said, you know what, honey? You know that's reverse racism, right? I said, well, babe, you know that's not a real thing. We've talked about that, but... You know, if it makes you feel better, we can, you know, talk about this when I get back, but I'm going. And so I went. And when I got there, it was like, I can't even tell you. It started off with Joe Biden, which I also love. But then it was Oprah Winfrey, First Lady Michelle Obama, and then my love, Barack Obama. <laughs> And what had started out as me just trying to prove a point suddenly became the single most meaningful event in my life. So I did what any normal person would do. I cried. I'm talking Oprah ugly cry circa the 90s. You know what I'm talking about. It was bad, but it was so good. And so I had this just feeling of like, this is it. Barack has given me back my life, so I got back to Dallas quick, fast, and in a hurry. And apparently while I was gone, my husband was indeed living his best white life, and he decided that he was going to be a BMX biker, because I guess that's what white guys do on their white wonderful weekends. <laughs> and so I tried to give him my like teacher, mother hen, sarcastic wife speech about how dangerous that was going to be, but I can honestly tell you, never in my life have I wished that my intuition had been wrong. Because what started out as a fun bike ride in the park soon became an accident with some broken bones and a headache, which then turned into a concussion. And then after many MRIs revealed that he had a brain tumor. And to say that I was stunned is an understatement. So my best brown life was going to need to wait, because this was our life. 
and we were in it together. That whole when sickness and health thing got real. And so I did what I do best, teacher mode, charts. I was ready. I had made the doctor's appointments. I found the specialist. I secured second and third opinions. I read every single dark prognosis Google has to offer, allowing zero time for panic. But when the surgery date arrived, there was no masking my fear. This was no longer an episode of Grey's Anatomy. This was my husband, my McDreamy. And he was up against a mountain. And so my wall went down, and I suffered. But teachers don't have the opportunity to suffer alone. I had to go back to work. I had to put on a happy face and walk in the door because these teenagers had still continued to live their best lives. And so I just went in because I couldn't close my office door. I just had to be up front all of the time. And so I put back up the wall as quickly as I could. And I was doing a pretty good job until the final assignment where the kids had to now write a rhetorical speech about an issue that needed more public recognition. So I, per I said, perfect, I'm gonna just, you know, educate some folks about brain tumors. They need to know this, we need more research. And so it was pretty abundantly clear that I had not followed my own advice when it was time for me to read my speech. I had not practiced in front of an audience. I had not made sure I was comfortable sharing something so personal. And so when I was about five minutes into the speech, the tears came. Cute tears this time, but tears nonetheless. And I tried every trick in the book to pull it together. I was like, come on, you've got to stop. But I just couldn't. And so I stood there and I wept in front of 16 teenagers. And suddenly those tears were for so many other things. They were for the nights I had sat by his bedside in complete fear. They were for the caregivers that had waited with me to offer me support. They were for our neurosurgeon, Dr. Rao, who I will always love second to Barack. <laughs> they were for all the years that I had felt lost and alone, except I wasn't alone, because when I looked up, Alex and Adam, and Allie, Brock, Daniel, Drake, Hannah, Ashani, Jordy, Karis, Max, Owen, and Sudeep, we're sitting there without judgment, some with tears on their own faces, willing me with their eyes to keep going. And they waited, not because I was their teacher, but because I was a real person who was suffering. And I would like to say that that moment was so rare for teachers. Rarely do we ever put that wall down but on that day, in that classroom, with those children, I wasn't invisible. They saw me for me. And I can say it changed my life because they showed me what it really means to be a human. Thank you. Crystal, everybody. I, I love and appreciate that story so much, um, not only for what it reminds us of, of the ways that um, kids can take care of us too, right? That they meet us when we need them, um, but also that there are so many kinds of crying. Just like a lot of, <laughs> and I had never really, you know, thought about all of those. Um, it's no, and it's and it's also that idea of how rare those moments are too is something that I think we we end up thinking about a lot because they are the story worthy moments, but they're story worthy because they're rare because they they we don't always get to have the room to have them. Um, that was beautiful. Thank you, Crystal. One more hand for Crystal. When I'm going to bring up our next storyteller. When I asked our next storyteller, tell us about a time you learned your lesson. He said. Every time his mother asks him, are you sure you don't need a jacket? <laughs> he said he learns this lesson over and over and over again. Please welcome Chris Dela Cruz. <laughs> so 
So it's the start of my hashtag fight the power class and it's the day that I'm gonna reveal the first project I've designed for students. I'm pumped. I've got Kendrick Lamar's All Right bumping through the smart board speaker. I got, I'm greeting each student as they come in. I see Damien walk in, he's got a new haircut. I know he's feeling himself. So I'm like, yo Damien, how much you pay for that haircut though? And he knows what's happening, so he snaps back immediately. More than you could sell those dusty Converse for, why? Ooh, boom, I love this, right? Like this is my jam. Like making student relationships, building student relationships is my superpower. And I love being with high school students, and especially at this part of my life. To give you context, this is about a year and a half ago. Uh, I had just finished grad school. It's my first, uh, first year full-time teaching. But more importantly, I had just moved to the South Bronx to live close to the students. And I moved uh, to a one-bedroom apartment that I was supposed to share with my girlfriend of two years. Her name was Joy until we broke up. So I'm heartbroken and kind of just trying to distract myself from that completely. And the thing is, with students, I get to be this like fun, energetic, hip, cool teacher Chris, like the Chris that I really love being. And like at home, I'm that like sad, pathetic Chris who's leaving these long voicemails on a block number <laughs> while like in between reading like relationship books by John Gottman. That Chris can stay at home, thank you very much. Because at the end, like that's not what students needed, right? Uh, they are, you know, they're teenagers, they're already dealing with their own thing, let alone they're black and brown teenagers trying to make it through an education system. So like I knew that I had to be that fun Chris. And so here I am, uh, at the start of the class, students are walking in, and my, uh, one of the students, Jose, walks in, right? And Jose, I'm like, yo, what's good, Jose? He avoids eye con go contact, goes straight to his seat. Now, Jose and I have a history. He was actually one of the first students I met during the home visit, and when I met him, he was completely shy and timid. Like, we have a home visit survey, and I'd ask him questions, and he would just answer, I don't know, or I'm good. Uh, but when we asked his mom, how would you describe uh, Jose, she once said that he got, he got a lot of suspensions at his last school and that she described him as odioso, or uh, hateful in Spanish. And I'm looking at this kid and I'm like, the hateful, like he's so quiet. But let me tell you, Jose contains multitudes. Because when we're together one-on-one, -on -one, uh, he's totally shy, but when he has an audience, yo, he will take advantage of it. For example, uh, during Summer Bridge, he's in my Summer Bridge group, and I have an icebreaker. My favorite icebreaker, it's a name icebreaker, where you pass around an object. I'm pumped about it. And uh, he, we go around and say each other's names. He's like, my name's Dubustus. I'm like, your name's Jose. He's like, you said uh, we could call, our, call ourselves by how we wanted, right? And you know, like I'm trying to be inclusive, so I'm like, yeah, okay, fine, do bustus, do bustus, great. So we're doing this, we're passing around, I'm like do bustus, do bustus, do bustus, passing this uh, marker around, and he's laughing and having a great time. I'm like, okay, yeah, he he likes me, this is good, this is great. Uh, other students are laughing as well. I'm like, wow, this icebreaker is really killing it. And uh, then um, after, I'm thinking to myself, wait a second. And so I ask one of his friends, I'm like, listen, for real, uh, what what does do bustus mean? And um, Yo, I didn't know I had an ASL translator for this, but um, uh, it turns out, and you can't find it on Urban Dictionary, but he was like, he's like, well, it's actually slang for masturbation. And I was like, what? So here I'm tossing this name around <laughs> like a total idiot. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so, uh, you know, and so this is him. He's either like this, this, he can either undermine your classroom or he won't speak to you. And so this time he's decided not to speak to me. And you know what? I'm letting it slide because I'm revealing this new project. And this new project, I've like, I spent weeks designing, by the way, but also with him in mind, with students who've been just kind of disengaged with traditional education. Let me tell you about this project. So it's going to be, uh, it was, Students were, had to focus on argumentation during that time, but I didn't want them to write an essay because I wanted to do like real argumentation. So what they were gonna do is they're gonna download a, cons a clip from a conservative media outlet critiquing the Black Lives Matter movement. And then they were gonna respond by editing the video with their own voices, using music, memes, anything. It was gonna be amazing, right? And so I explain it to the class. I'm acting like I'm like some Dominican Steve Jobs, like <laughs> announcing this big project. And at the end, I'm like, and it's called hashtag fight the media. Boom, mic drop. I look around, right? And these students, like I see some smiling. I'm like, good feedback, good feedback. But then in the back, I hear Jose say, yo, this is stupid. Why can't we just write an essay? <laughs> I'm like, what? My man, it's like, <laughs> I just spent weeks designing this and designing it specifically for you. Like I was dead set on building a relationship with this kid because I know what, his, what, what it was like for him in middle school and I'm trying to engage him and he wants an essay? Yo, and 
and also I should mention that Jose is actually part of my advisory and my advisee. So I'm the one who gets to see him the most. In our school, like part of our advising system is you meet with the student every week, every other week, one on one, right? And I love these advisee meetings. Like this is like the foundation of building relationships. And with each student, I have like my own ritual with them that's like really fun. With one student, we like open up a YouTube video, a funny YouTube video, and comment on it because you really like comedy. Another one will share a song that we have to listen to for the next meeting and discuss it. Uh, with one, we just have this section called This Week in Crushes where we discuss who they're crushing on, which I love. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when I went to go see Jose and pick him up for the first time, I picked him up from class and he said, I'm busy doing work. And I was like, oh, okay, all right, uh, I'll come next time. So I come again to another class and he's like, I'm, I'm working right now. And it's wild because he's actually falling behind in a lot of his classes. So I know he's not really doing the work. And so I'm saying, okay, well, then after school, how about we meet after school, okay? I meet with some students after school. That'll be fine. So uh, at the end of the day, students dismiss. And I look around for him, nowhere to be found. And I see him the next morning. I say, where were you? And he said, I forgot. So, like, here I am saying, like, building relationships is my jam, but, like, or my superpower, but like Jose's like my kryptonite, right? He's like literally hiding from me now and not trying to meet with me. And so I'm at a loss, but then I see him, he's at lunch and he's playing Connect Four and there's a bunch of students around him and he's actually like beating every student at Connect Four. He's very good at it. And so I see him and I'm actually kind of feeling a little like petty from when he like commented on my project in class. So I go up to him and I'm like, yo, uh, I want to challenge you in Connect Four. And he's like, all right, fine. So we play. And let me let you know, like, I wasn't good at sports in high school, but board games, I can kill. So we play, and uh, I lose. And, of course, all his friends are like, oh! And they're like, he beat you, he beat you. And I can't have that. So that afternoon, I go to his class, and I'm like, uh, Jose, can we meet? And he looks at me, and I'm like, oh, no, no, not for advising, but for a rematch. <laughs> so I take him up. I take him up to the eighth floor. I set up a room. The Connect Four set is there. And uh, I'm ready. We're playing again, and he beats me again. And I'm like, all right, um, how about we do a rematch next week? He says, okay. And all of a sudden, we start meeting regularly. The problem, though, is that anytime I ask him any questions about himself or about his work, he says, I don't know, or I'm good. So, you know, and I know he's still falling behind. Teachers are telling me he's falling behind his classes. So you have to help him out. But, like, I can't get to him at all. So, in, like, in Connect Four, I'm losing. In Advising, I'm losing. And not to mention, like, back home, I'm losing as well, right? Because I'm there in my apartment. My usual routine is, like, after lesson plans, I'll, like, cook for one, pour a bottle, a, pour a glass of, a bottle of wine, pour, <laughs> pour a glass of wine, and I've got, like, uh, I've got, like, Drake playing in the background as I'm, like, looking through old uh, memories of Joy and I, and by the way, like, for the Drake scholars in the house, like, this is views, and this is not, like, the, like, rapping, like, uplifting, turn my birthday into a lifestyle Drake. This is, like, the singing, like, redemptions on, my, on your mind when you think about me, Drake, like, that real sad Drake that's going on. Uh, so that's playing, and I'm usually looking through stuff, but, you know, then I decide, finally, to follow the advice of my new therapist, who says, uh, you, she's like, you have to stop looking at these old things. You have to stop, like, replaying the relationship highlight reel, as she put it, which, and I was like, okay, all right, fine. So I decided, I'd bring out this suitcase of mine, and I start putting away all this stuff. And of course, because I guess I like torturing myself, I like take a moment with each thing <laughs> as I put it away. And um, then I come across this list of questions. Um, and all, it hits me, the, uh, these list of questions, they were back uh, early on in my relationship with Joy, back in uh, 2015. And uh, the list of questions called the 36 questions that lead to love that uh, New York Times had released. It was like a big fad. Uh, everyone was trying them out. And I remember when I saw them, Joy and I were like three months into the relationship. I was really into her, and I really wanted it to keep going. So I wanted to try out these questions. So we did them together. And these questions aren't like highly romantic either. They're actually very simple. They ask things like, uh, what does friendship mean to you? Or uh, share an embarrassing moment. But what they force you to do is just like be present with someone else and listen to them as they share about themselves. And not this like, you don't share your like first date best version of you really, like uh, version of you. You share that like authentic version of you. That, that version that people choose to love, right? And let me tell you, these questions, they worked. Like, I was in love. But in that moment, in front of my suitcase with Drake playing in the background, I regretted that these questions ever happened. And I didn't want to have anything to do with them. So I'm about to put them away, but then I'm like, wait a second. These questions worked. And they might work for Jose. <laughs> and not that I'm trying to get Jose to fall in love with me, right? But, like, I want something, like, at least beyond I don't know in, in our relationship. So uh, next time we have our rematch, I have the Connect Four set, uh, Connect Four set up, and I have the questions there. And he comes in, and I say, listen, uh, before we begin, 
I want to distract you a little bit because you're getting a little too good at this game. Uh, I have a list of questions, and we'll just ask them back and forth. But the thing is, you can't pause from the questions and playing. That's kind of how, how I'm going to distract you. And he, because he doesn't want to let up on a challenge, is like, all right, but I go first. I say, okay. So he starts with the first question. He says, out of anyone in the world, whom would you want as a dinner guest? And so I answer, uh, probably Drake at this point in my life. <laughs> what about you? And he says, no one. And I wait, and he knows I'm looking for something more, and he says, no, seriously, no one. I think it's weird to watch someone you admire eat. <laughs> I said, that makes sense. And so then I ask the next question. Uh, I ask, uh, if you do you want to be famous, and if so, in what way? He says, no. <laughs> and he goes, no, seriously, I don't like people in my business. What about you? And I said, yo, I would like to be the host of my own TV show. <laughs> and he says, I can imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> and so we keep playing, and we're, we're like getting to know each other through these questions. And then this question comes up. What would you consider a perfect day? I ask him. And he says, he pauses. And he's like, to be honest, a day where I just don't get in trouble. And he really means that. And he looks to me for my response, and all of a sudden I go into like happy teacher mode. I'm like, um, I don't know, uh, like a day where I get to teach, uh, something like that. But then I'm looking at him, looking at me, and I'm like, yo, this kid's modeling like vulnerability and honesty. And I've been on him about being guarded when in reality, like I've been guarded this whole time with this happy, cool teacher thing. And so I decided to take a risk. And I say, well, if we're being honest, a perfect day right now is one in which I'm not sad about my ex-girlfriend. And then in my mind, I'm like, oh God, I just crossed the line. That was weird. <laughs> oh no, what's gonna happen? And he responds, really? I didn't know you got sad. I said, I know. And so we keep playing. We keep asking questions. We, we, one of the questions was, what are you most grateful for? Another one was, how would you change the way you were raised? We keep dropping the pieces. And with each piece we drop, it feels like we're dropping a bit of that armor that we're holding. He's dropping that like guarded class jokester armor, and I'm dropping that cool hip teacher armor. And then all of a sudden he says, connect four. <laughs> I win. And I say, all right. Rematch next week? He says, sure. I go, questions included? He's like, yeah, all right. And I say, all right. Looks like we got a ritual. Thank you. All right, now I get to play the role of host for a moment. Um, wasn't that last storyteller great? Uh, <laughs> uh, but if you like that last story, you're going to love this next storyteller. You're already familiar with her. When I asked her, uh, tell us about a time you learned your lesson, she said, when I was running to make it to a teacher PD workshop, fell on my face and taught anyway. <laughs> Everyone, give it up for Michaela Bly. So it's, um, it's spring, I'm teaching third grade, it's the last unit of the year in social studies and it's the Oregon Trail. And <laughs> <laughs> a lot of dramatic possibility in the Oregon Trail. <laughs> I'm prepared to have my students really live the Oregon Trail. Um, that was how I taught. I would create worlds for them and then run them a little like a puppet master. Um, Usually those worlds were pretty silly. Uh, when we studied geography, the United States, I had a stuffed animal rock band lost across the United States, writing us desperate notes, asking us where they were, and we had to research the states to get them home, that kind of thing. We got letters from people like Cheesy De Pizza and Caesar Von Salad. Um, I made those up myself. But <laughs> now, now it's the Oregon Trail. And this was a dark time and a complicated time in American history. I don't feel confident enough as a teacher to get at the moral and historical uh, implications of westward expansion with nine-year-olds, right? I don't know that I can do that. But what I can do is, is give them a sense of 
um, the, the gravity of it. You know, these were pioneers in the 1840s um, from going from Independence, Missouri to Oregon City, risking everything they had, leaving everything they knew, walking for 2,000 miles. And so I want that to be the way we experience it. So I come to my students and I say, we're going to study the Oregon Trail. And this one know-it-all kid, Alex, says, well, will it be a game? Because he knows it's always a game. And I say, yeah, but it's going to be a dangerous game. <laughs> He's pretty excited about that. So. Basically, what I want to do is I want to have a simulation where we are a wagon train that we work to, we travel together as characters and we travel the Oregon Trail. And so the first thing they have to do is think of character names for themselves. They can keep their first names, but I download and print a list of names of people who really died on the Oregon Trail for them to choose their last names. <laughs> so now they have last names like, you know, Chubbuck and Blunderfield and Alex discovers that he's now Alex Bacon, which he's very excited about. And then they have to choose occupations and all the girls want to be pop stars. And I say, there were no pop stars on the Oregon Trail. <laughs> you have to choose occupations that would have existed in the 1840s. And so now, great, they're farmers and doctors and, and blacksmiths and so fine. But before we start, I want them to get a sense of what it really felt like to walk that much. So this is New York City. I take them on a 40 block walk. <laughs> it's about two miles. Um, it's not so much, but I guess it's a lot if you're nine. Um, it's a beautiful day. <laughs> It's a beautiful day. We're walking up the Hudson River, and, and um, it's, it's great. And Alex Bacon says to me, um, I'm thirsty. And I say, oh, well, there were no water fountains on the Oregon Trail. <laughs> and he says, well, there's a water fountain right there. And I think that I don't want to get that parent phone call about withholding water from a child. And so I think fast. I want to keep it dramatic. So I say, aha, how fortunate, a stream. Let us partake. <laughs> i get a drink. So we come back, we're ready to start. And um, basically, the way I've designed this game, up until now, I want to say, I knew everything that was going to happen in my game. I'd write letters, they'd write letters back. It was all very just fiction. Now I want an element of chance, because it was all, you know, you left your lives up to fate when you took the Oregon Trail. And so I, what I've done to design this game is I've combined um, the Oregon Trail video game. Do you guys remember that video game? A lot of fans, some fans. Um, with uh, Principles of Dungeons and Dragons, the role-playing game with dice. So basically how that works is every day, every morning, I tell them what happened that day on the Oregon Trail. We make some choices, they decide what to do, and then we roll to find out if they succeeded or failed. So for example, we come to a river. They decide to float their wagons across, and we roll to find out if the wagons sank or floated. So that kind of thing. So great. So I, um, to prepare for the first day, I have um, sewn myself a bonnet out of old upholstery material. <laughs> I put on my bonnet. And I introduce myself as Mary, the wagon train captain. And I tell them, welcome to the most dangerous and exciting journey of your lives. We have all come here for different reasons, but we will have to work together to fight the bad weather and raging rivers that await us. And Alex Bacon says, hey, Mary, this is a dangerous game. Could we die? And at this point, I was pretty in character. And I also admit I wanted to take Alex Bacon down a peg. <laughs> So I said, sure. People died on the Oregon Trail all the time. Someone might die. And this shiver of excitement goes across my <laughs> class. <laughs> they like stuffed animals, but they love danger. And, and I know I'm not going to let it get there. No one's going to die on the Oregon Trail. But the idea that someone might gets them wanting to come to social studies every day. So this is OK. So we're off, and we're rolling our dice and tracking our mileage and hunting and all the things. And it's going great. The problem is. Every time we start social studies, someone says to me, is someone going to die today? Is someone going to die today? And I keep putting them off and putting them off. And finally, it's, it's two weeks into my project. Um, it's been going so well. And I think, you know what? We're getting close to the Rockies. I'll give them a brush with death. <laughs> so I write a bunch of possibilities for the day. And the next time someone asks me, is someone going to die today? I say, we have been lucky thus far but the Rockies lie ahead, the most treacherous part of our journey. Who knows what might happen? So I put on my bonnet, and I, and I tell them that I set the scene for the day. Um, in the early morning light on a Rocky Mountain Pass, a wagon wheel hits a rock, and the wagon is overturned. Someone is trapped beneath the wagon. Let us roll to find out who it is. I will say for the record, I'm not proud of this. This is not a story about best practice. This is <laughs> established that. 
take off my bonnet. I have a system of, of numbers for um, each kid has a number assigned, and I roll, and I find out it's Catherine Chubbick. She's a farmer. She's this little girl, Katie. Um, she is one of these kids who always has really messy hair, and she sounds like she's been smoking since she was three. <laughs> you know those kids? And she has to come to the front of the class, and I say, Catherine Chubbick, your legs have been trapped beneath this wagon. Roll to find out uh, if you get free and what happens. And she rolls, and she finds out that her legs have been freed, but they've been infected. Now, I want to remind you at this point that um, I wrote all these possibilities. <laughs> And this is the first time I'm thinking, why exactly did I write that possibility? This is getting a little dark. Uh, and I say, Catherine Chubbuck, your legs have become infected. Roll to find out if you get better or worse. And she rolls. And it gets worse. <laughs> and she just looks at me and goes, did I die? And as soon as she says it, I realize how badly I have messed up. I did not write any more possibilities. We've reached the end of what I know can happen. We are in uncharted territory. What happens next? Do we have a funeral on the side of the Oregon Trail? Is this the parent phone call I get for having killed a child on the Oregon Trail? I'm thinking, what can I possibly do? And just then, from the back of the classroom, a little girl, Ellis, whose Oregon Trail name was Dr. Ellis Chapman, just goes, wait, I'm a doctor! And I'm like, oh, thank the Lord. And I say, Dr. Ellis Chapman brings her doctor bag. She knows how to heal the wound. Roll to find out what happens. The only way you die is if you roll a six. That's the only way you die. <laughs> the whole class is holding its breath. And she rolls. And it's a three. <laughs> class, it's like the end of Apollo 13. Kids are like throwing papers in the air and <laughs> hugging each other. And Ellis is hugging Katie and Katie's going, I almost died. I almost died. <laughs> and I just feel so grateful that we let a doctor on the wagon train even though she couldn't hunt. And, and I know that sometimes, <laughs> I know that sometimes we put our lives in the hands of fate, but that day I put my life in the hands of Dr. Ellis Chapman. And I have to tell you, um, a couple years ago, I ran into Katie, who was in eighth grade, uh, on the street, and she looked just the same, except she'd been stretched, you know? <laughs> and um, I hugged her, and I asked her how she was, and the first thing she said to me, she said, do you remember when I almost died on the Oregon Trail? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, Katie, I totally remember. <laughs> Thank you. So stories start from change, right? Something happened in between to make you change in that way. Or sometimes stories happen as a result of a new change that's happened. So there are so many ways that we can get into our stories. Um, so I really urge you um, this week um, to share those stories. And um, not just to share stories of this is what I did in the classroom, but to realize that we all bring our whole selves into our work. Whether we're in the classroom currently or used to be and now do something else with education, we all bring our whole selves there. We are, we have our vulnerabilities, right? Our vulnerabilities might be the kid who doesn't buy our act or a principal with full sleeve tattoos um, or our husband or Alex Bacon, right? It, it could be anything, um, but we bring all of that in with us and that doesn't make us weak or, or distracted, that makes us who we are, that makes us the real people that we are. And I think those are the people that our students need. So um, as you're going through this week, I really wanna urge you, we're gonna be looking at so many new strategies and all these exciting things and looking at stuff you've never thought of before, um, but also remember that we're doing what we do best, which is connecting with each other and being real and, and being there for our students in a really real way. Um, so thank you so much for having us. Um, I want to thank, before we, we finish and take just, uh, before, we, before we finish, I do want to thank um, Ron and the whole team for having us. Let's hear it for South by Southwest EDU. <laughs> um, this show was directed by the incredible Catherine McCarthy, who heads the education program. Let's hear it for Catherine McCarthy. And let's have one more hand for our storytellers. Have a wonderful week and thank you so much. See you later.